And B, women are not seen as the emotional ones. Women are seen as the ones who are able to feel emotions and still be able to be strong. And I think that's really important to note because that's such a contrast. Anyway, I used up a, mo a little more time than I wanted to. The session was originally supposed to be 90 minutes, but part of our time doing it. We have 10 minutes, yeah. Let's discuss a little bit, maybe? And we can or do questions? Or so I have something to add because um, I think the issue that we have as a society is that we're, we're taking, um, you know, Hinduism treats women with respect, but our society, our culture doesn't. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is derived from, you know, some of our texts, I think. Well, I believe. In so some I, have, and I have something interesting to say about that, which I was going to say part of my thing, but I finish here. And, um, you know, how, how you're saying that all of these women, they can defend themselves. That's true, they can defend themselves. But the issue that I have is, why, do they, why are they put in a situation where they have to, you know, defend themselves so, when men don't really have those same sort of issues? Okay, so I'm gonna let me say a couple things about both of those things. So the first thing is, you look at the Ramayana and you look at the Mahabharata. So it's interesting because some people actually say that Valmiki originally intended the Ramayana to be the story of Sita, not the, not the story of Rama. It was originally supposed to be her story, right? Um, and both in the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, I think a lot of the key things are women kind of running the show. Um, the Mahabharata war happens, um, and one of the key things driving the fact that the Mahabharata war is going to happen is Draupadi. Mm -hmm. Draupadi says, they treated me like this, um, and we talked about how Krishna went to try to form Sandhi, like peace, 17 times. Each of those times, Krishna talks to Yudhishthira, he talks to Bhima, he talks to Arjuna, Nakula, Sahadeva. Yudhishthira says, I want peace. This is my family, I don't want to go to war with them. Bhima says, I'll listen to my brother. Like, it's very reluctant, but I'll listen to my brother. Ajuna, Nakula, Sahadeva, they all say, I'll listen to my brother. And then Krishna comes to Draupadi and says, what do you think? I mean, you've been part of all of this the whole time as well. What do you think? And she says, me? I want them to be destroyed. Whatever you do, don't bring them, don't bring peace. Bring, make sure the war happens because I want them to be destroyed. And Krishna tries to bring about peace. But like one of the driving forces of this war happening is Draupadi. She's she is a force to be contended with. So like there's a women are playing an active role in this story. And the other thing we need to realize is that Draupadi is in a position where she needs to be defended, right? But yes, so like in the first game of dice, she was sold, she was put in this humiliating position. But so were her husbands. Technically, they were all, they'd all sold themselves. And it was supposed to be as much of a humiliation to them as it was to her that this was happening to her. And part of it is that we said men and women need to, to be treated equally. But like, what counts as, hard, like the level of hardship different things count for, for women is different from what they would count for as men. The Pandavas were sold, Draupadi was sold, and if the Pandavas were disrobed in a full court, that would have been humiliating, but not at the same level that this the thing with Draupadi gets to us. Right? It's it's different. Like this is so like this thing that you say of like why are women put in this position where men aren't? The truth of the matter is I think in the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, so are the men. The men are also put in these positions. And the second thing is these stories are the stories we tell because there's conflict. Because people are put in these horrible positions and are forced to uphold Tanma anyway. Like, we're not telling the stories of all the happily ever afters, right? Because there is no, there, there's less that we can learn there. So I think it's a combination of those two things. And the third thing is you say, some of how women are treated today is because of scriptures. So what we talked about, what I've been talking about this entire time, so I mentioned the Valmi Ramayana, I mentioned the Mahabharata as, taught, as written by Vyasa, and I mentioned the Bhagavatam, right? So let's put those three aside for a second. Let's realize that in the millennia since then, all of these things have been written and rewritten. So we, yesterday we talked about the fact that in the Jain version of the Ramayana, there, Rama doesn't kill Ravana. Lakshmana does. And in the Buddhist version of the Ramayana, there is no Ravana. Because both of these religions believe in peace. They believe that killing someone is fundamentally evil, right? So they 
want to avoid a situation where Rama, who's this revered, perfect god, has to kill someone because they, you can't reconcile those two facts. And so they rewrite the story in a way that suits their purpose. Um, similarly, like there, in Telugu canon, um, there's a story from the Bhagavatam that they've kind of added in of Satyabhama is upset at Krishna for some reason. And Krishna is trying to convince her, like, it's okay, like, please, like, he's pleading with her, he's talking to her, husbands and wives have arguments, presumably, I'm not married, I don't know. But I hear that they do. And he's trying to convince her to be happy with him again. And as part of that, she's lying on a bed, and he's at the foot of the bed, and he's, like, talking to her. And she, like, kind of kicks her leg out in anger, and it hits his crown, and it throws it off. And Krishna re reacts to it beautifully. He says, oh, your poor delicate foot, you're such, you're a princess, and the delicate foot had to come hit my sharp, pointy, hard crown. I hope you're okay. She's like, essentially kicked him on the head. And this is her husband, this is Krishna, this is Bhagwan, right? And why does the story exist in Telugu canon? It exists because there was a king, Sri Krishna who ruled the Vijayanagar kingdom in southern India. My brother mentioned it during his talk yesterday. Um, and he, in, a, in some interaction with his wife, his wife's foot accidentally hit his head. And he basically said, I am done with you. I am a king. I'm so powerful. And you, hit my, you kicked my head. How dare you? I'm done with you. I'm not going to see you anymore. And he left. And his court found out about this. And they were all really upset about this. And his kingdom was famous for having these great, eight great poets. So one of those poets said, you know what? I can try to fix this problem. So he wrote this play about how Satyabhama kicked Krishna on purpose. And he still reacted to it so well. And this is Krishna who's Bhagavan, and Sri Krishnadevaraya is just a king. So he says, if Krishna himself can deal with it like this, why can't you? Mm -hmm. So one of the things with our, with our Itihasas is that we've rewritten and rewritten so many versions of these that like, we've written out some of these strengths in these characters. People have changed these stories to match their political aspirations. That if you want a kingdom where the women are subservient, make Sita as docile as you can and then say, ha, this is what you're supposed to be like. She's perfect. Um, so we've done a little bit of We only have five minutes really left in the session, so I just want to see who has questions or comments. Yeah. I think, and I also have one, but I think the Mahika has something to start with. Um, also, we can also continue the discussions and questions upstairs. Yeah, during the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I was just wondering, do you think we can extend this like 10 more minutes? I think we have 20 minutes for tea break versus like, I don't think that would be as, because once we get upstairs, I don't think this conversation will continue as intense. Why don't we go upstairs, sit in a circle, in that, that tea area? Can okay. we do that? Just, let's transform this circle. Well, because then we have a whole other sitting yeah. down here after, so we should take an actual break. But we can just push it slightly. Who else would want to? That's fine, we can do 10 minutes of uh, Yeah, I just don't yeah. want us to push the break. Do you want to? No, we're not pushing the We're going to break up uh, uh, instead of 30 minutes. Break it's kind of getting late. But, okay. I mean, sure. Because I do think that this is yeah. important. Yeah. 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 Let's make yeah. that. We just have a comment to add on this. Uh, I mean, could you also say that uh, Hinduism is feminine in nature? Because if you, I mean, if you take the whole of creation, I mean, starting from Durga and Mahishasura Mardini and creation of wealth with Lakshmi and creation of knowledge with Saraswati, everything creation based and even the Mother Earth, I mean, it's all feminine in nature. I would. I would resist on saying that because I think we do, as a religion or a culture, do a pretty good job of balancing it out. Mm. We have like Prakriti, which is female, and then Parmeshwar, male. Yeah. Like, you know, like we, we, we make it very clear that there is a balance in these forces. Yeah. To add on that, I think we do have this um, Srishti, Siddhi, Laya, Karaku, which are the men as well. So, which tell about uh, Vishnu, Shiva, and Brahma. So that balances out all mm -hmm. the creations. Oh, okay. uh, so that's how it's balanced. Also, just I, like I do also believe that Hinduism is fundamentally feminist, but I don't think that a lot of what you said today fits the modern day definition of feminism. Um, so I can see why, you, like I, because I do agree that Hinduism is fundamentally feminist, but you say that a woman should be pati vrata, but why, why doesn't the man have the same dharma? Why does a man have multiple dharmas, but the woman in these situations that's, they're so being... I, I would say that's so untrue, true. right? Like that's what we've talked so about. That's what, that, that is what we talk about with like, that's what Sita points out. <laughs> and he says, 
my dharma goes beyond just being your wife. Like, yes, you're, you have the dharma of being a king and being my husband, and you've chosen that being a king is important. But I also have the dharma of being the queen. And you... So that's where she I think, calls him out on the back of what he think, was wrong. That's where I think the anti-feminism comes in, because she is the one who has to defend herself. She is the one that has to say, like, you didn't acknowledge my dharma. Why, aren't them, why, haven't, why didn't Ram recognize that himself? Why, because when he, like, these, and I, and he's Sorry, he was being stripped, none of the men stood up for her. So Why think, were they leaving it to God? Because, okay, like, I know that we joked about it today, yeah. but imagine that I'm being, like, mm -hmm. violently treated on the street right now. Mm -hmm. No, none of you are going to stand by and say, oh, Krishna will come and help her. Do you see how wrong that sounds? No, like, I, mean, I, I, I agree. I like that. Well, that was a I, it is a question, I guess. So I, so, from a, from a but can you see how that is an anti-feminist? Right. No, that's, so okay. so let me let can I oh, sorry. Right. No, sorry. Can right. I say so two things? One thing is what Rama does. So again, let's keep in mind that this is not Vali Ramayana again. We're talking about Bhagavad's play and that happened much later in terms of when it was written. Um, but if you were to analyze that, Rama gets called out on the fact that what he did was wrong. He gets called out by, on it by Sita when she, they leave her in the forest. She says, "It was my dharma. He, you should have listened to me." And that's called like that is called out in the book. So like that 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 he is Rama does not mean that he never does anything wrong. He gets called out on it in that. Um, and then the next day morning, the kingdom wakes up and the court wakes up, and the court says, like his mother, like his mother says that. The court says that, like everyone kind of says, you didn't have the right to make that unilateral decision. You shouldn't have sent her away. Okay, but no. So, so like, so the thing is, like, I think you're making an assumption that if Rama did it, it must be right for it to like be like you know. So before this, uh, like, the text itself is not saying that what he did was right. It's saying this is what happened, but look, everyone's saying it's wrong. No, no, but like going. So we're saying that the play might not even be true, right? So let's focus on the Ramayana, which. Which they're hoping yeah, is more true, true than the okay. play, right? Oh, okay. So in that sense, before we've even gotten to the play and he sent her away, there, in that sense when Rama is being sent away, he has that dharma of being a king and being... When um, Rama is being sent away? When Sita is being sent away, you're saying? No, 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 no we're fired. <coughs> no, I'm saying when Rama is exiled in the very beginning. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and he course. says to her, like, I'm leaving. Like he, why, he has why, the is her, being the son. why is her dharma at that point only to go with him? Why That's did she why didn't she acknowledge her dharma of being queen then? Well, what else is because what? she wasn't queen, right? She yeah. was a princess. Okay. So she wasn't queen, so she didn't have the dharma of being a queen. And also it was because she made the choice. So we, yeah. like Rama says Rama tells her to stay and he says, You're a daughter in law, stay here with my parents. You're a princess, stay here in the palace. You're like stay here and be comfortable because like you do have these other dharmas, fulfill those instead. And she says, No, I want to come with you. That isn't I would say it would be just as anti-feminist to say she didn't have the right to make that decision. Oh no, I he, agree with that. Oh, he, he's not he's not forcing her to come. He's not saying you're my wife, so come with me. He's literally saying, You're my wife and that's great and all, but you should stay here because you're a princess and because you're a daughter-in-law and you have responsibilities here and you have the right to just be here and be happy. You're a princess. Your parents got me married. Got you married to me so that you would be comfortable and have a happy life, not so you would run around in the forest with me, right? So stay here. So like he he's not the one that's claiming that she should go to the forest or follow him or that being his wife is her top priority. That's okay. Oh, and now chosen. another question, like when Draupadi. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So my question was in conjunction uh, to what he was saying, I really loved the way he went off uh, depicted the various uh, uh, women basically in our itihasa. Just to point on uh, Sita or Mother Sita, uh, we didn't touch upon say warfare, uh, which a lot of people typically say, oh why only the guys will fight. But it's important to note that uh, Sita was also an accomplished warrior, mm -hmm. killing a lot of uh, Dhanavas uh, growing up under, I mean, in the kingdom of uh, Jana. And uh, she also had a lot of power. She was able to string and unstring uh, the bow of Lord Shiva. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that is why that so bow was given the test during her swayamvar. They had to find she herself first, that powerful she because she was that powerful. She strung herself first. That's the story. She yeah. strung herself. So Janaka said, for this one, I have to find someone who is equally of match to strung the bow of Ra of Shiva. And that's she, where the swayamvar was held. Yeah. 
and she basically made a decision to choose her husband choose around husband. so many uh, different uh, men, including Robert, in, including yeah. maybe, yeah. which is unprecedented uh, in human history. So those are the yeah. points, and yeah. that is the mindset that one has to kind of develop uh, to even analyze uh, Ramayana. I would say. So, yeah. And I think the thing that you said about Draupadi, why did she have to defend herself? And I think so. This is where you have to understand the context of what's going on in that in that scene. That that isn't to say that oh, like that scene is to like is used to show just how far the Guru Dynasty has fallen. Why there is this burning, pressing need for the Kurukshetra War to happen later. Why this needs to kind of be cleansed. Why they need a new king on the throne. So like it's very important. The fact that bad things sometimes happen in Itahasas does not mean that those bad things are things that Hinduism says are okay, right? Like that scene is shown as a place where all those men in the court are individually called out on failing horribly on their karmas. So it, so they they're not saying oh Draupadi should have stood up for herself. Oh you should wait for Krishna. Every single man in that court, name by name, is called out. And they use Draupadi's voice to call her out. But like the, the fundamental point of that scene is this dynasty has fallen. It's fallen so hard that this war needs to happen. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very powerful example because what happens is, see, in the text, if you, if you analyze it properly, as she mentioned, the degeneration of dharma is called out upon severely by uh, at that point, that's number one. Uh, but also, what has happened is, why did these great Kavis decide to put those episodes in there? Mm -hmm. If he was completely anti-feminine, let's say, then they sort of said, you know what? Okay, Ram Kipta Sita, and uh, it was all good. There was never any rebellion. Sita accepted it. And then uh, he got Agni Paksha. She said, okay, no problem. But if you look at the Valmiki Ramayana, Sita shows a very strong character. Yeah. Where they show, where they actually say, she says, you know what, you keep doing this to me, you keep doing this to me. And Valmiki beautifully bring, brings that out. And then Tulsi does even further in the bhakti form, brings it out and says, these are the mistakes. So Ram made a choice. It's like President Obama, daughter gets kidnapped. How many people know the U.S. has no terrorism negotiation policy? Yeah. Right? So today, he has two choices. Daughter gets kidnapped, Sasha and Malia get kidnapped, let's say. And it's by Al-Qaeda. And Al-Qaeda comes and says, Work, give us $500 million or, or release this country or that country, whatever, you pull out of Iraq, whatever. So U.S. has a no negotiation policy, so he has two choices. He can make the choice of a Raj Dharma by saying our country will not bow down no matter what you do. Or he has a choice.